uh, very early on, unfortunately, I, in a moment of crass stupidity, said that I would give a paper at this year's symposium. And um, the, 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 essentially, Richard here has two sort of secret weapons to try and get people to do papers. One's called Gina, one's called Elizabeth. If one doesn't get you, the other one surely will. Uh, so blame them if you don't think it's any good. Um, so there I was back in March or April, um, sitting in my office wondering what on earth I was going to talk about right now. And I had a chance call from uh, the technical manager of one of our member companies. I'm looking around the, at the room. I, he was here yesterday and he's not here today, which is a shame because I, I could have actually, again, I could have sort of laid off a bit more blame on somebody else. But what he said to me, um, in, and this is in, in, in relation to the, the new standards that we now have, the NH150 in particular, uh, it, it, there's a certain amount of concern with the calculations. And he, he just said, it would be useful to have a worked example for some of these calculations. Um, and I, I stupidly thought, well, that's a good idea. I mean, for sure, it put everyone to sleep in, in September when I come here. But, but that, that was the, if you like, the, the germ of, of the idea that, of, of, of the paper that you have. And, and really, it's, 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 it's there to try and dispel the fact or dispel the myth that these calculations are somehow difficult. Um, one of the things you can do when you have a worked example on paper, of course, is use that to put into uh, your calculation software. And I have a natural reticence, and it's interesting that it came out yesterday as well, I have a natural concern with design software. The idea that you can just sort of bang in your numbers or the parameters and get this magic answer out. Um, engineering students, and I think I mentioned earlier, I think involvement with engineering students, should develop some feel for the trade-offs that are going on when we talk about things like traction or rope factor safety or even guide rail calculations. They have, should, should have a, a feel for how they can optimize their design. Um, so what I'm going to do today, uh, the, the difficult bit really, is that I'm actually going to just touch on what's changing in P8150, the new standard which has all these design calculations in it, which is now being published. I'm going to touch on the differences or changes from the old P81 part one or part two. Um, more importantly, I'm going to touch on some of the engineering implications that I see when I look at these calculations, and hopefully some of it will be of some interest. For sure, I will not be overrunning. Um, so, there we are. Uh, the 81 part one was introduced now 16 years ago. When it came out, it was a tremendous shock because it was double the thickness of the previous standard and it had a load more calculations of various annexes in the back. Uh, there were calculations for guide rails. Previously, people select, selected their guide rails either with um, graphical methods or perhaps an in-house company calculation. Uh, ditto with, with rope traction that there was some uh, notes in the previous standard that suddenly there was a very much more complex set of equations to work your way through. Um, but the, the big shock was that uh, you know, factor of safety of 12 for ropes wasn't any more enough. There was this quite irksome looking calculation and, and really quite not very transparent, I just say. And that, that did bother people. Now, the good news is that the, the EN8150 has very few changes from what we saw in 1998. So uh, that almost means I can sit down in two or three minutes, but, but not quite. Um, so, so just, just to anchor where we are with EN8120 and EN8150, EN8120 is now uh, published. It is shortly to become the harmonized standard uh, for the design of new lifts. It references EN8150. EN8150 does all the, if you like, nerdy, geeky stuff, like design calculations and with details of things like type examination. Most people don't need to know all that stuff, so it goes into EN8150. EN8120 is a standard that most of us will be working with most of the time. Uh, and the last thing is that there's this document pub which will be published in the next few weeks, SENTR81 Part 12, is somehow kind of guidance to the application of these new standards, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. So I'm going to go through guide rails, traction, rope factor safety. 
three things, and then, then we're out, okay? They're the changes for, for guide rails. The actual calculation method for, for guide rails hasn't really changed. What has changed is that there's now an explicit requirement in EN8120 that the design considers other things than the guide rail deflection. So you've got to consider the deflection of the bits that anchor the guide rail back to the wall or back to the structure. That's pretty obvious, and frankly, lots of engineers have been doing that for years. But it's now an explicit normative requirement in the side. <coughs> By normative, we mean that you must do that requirement if you are going to claim that you conform with standard. And there's, there's a few other bits, like there's, there's, there's some equations with vertical loads, um, which include a few more factors like the weight of the guides and the push-through forces of the guide brackets and all that sort of stuff. What's also very important is that whereas the old standard just gave you some calculations, uh, <coughs> you've now got the option of either doing the calculations in the age 150 or you can run away with, I think it's EN1991, which is a structure type uh, standard. You can do your calculations according to that or with a finite element analysis type um, package, which I suspect a lot of people will do because you know, a lot of people are using very advanced CAD systems now and arguably they'll get improved uh, results that way. So really this, this, this slide just mirrors the previous one. Calculation requirements in the EA 20 and now that have been carried across into the EA 50 it has this requirement to look at the other deflection um, contributors. The comment I'd make on uh, the guide rail calculations is, is a simple one. You need to select your guide rail and then these calculations are to prove its adequacy. Uh, and we'll come back later to how do you select a guide rail in the first place or a guide rail size in the first place. But, so without bashing through the calculations, if you like, there's three or four slides I've missed out, and then they're the ones bashing through all the hard stuff. Um, there are some implications that come from the equations which are in the standard, and I just wanted to share them with you. The most important one is, and this is hopefully not surprised a lot of people, but the deflection of a guide rail with a force loading it is proportional to the cube of the distance between its <coughs> Now that's, that's pretty straightforward. But it means that, for instance, going back to the point we made earlier about we now have to think about the deflection of guy brackets and the like. Say I designed a lift to the old standard and my guy rail deflection was on the knife edge, just about within the five millimeters that's allowed for a car guide, say. And say now I look at my design and I, I realize that my guide bracket might deflect by a couple of millimeters. I've now got a seven millimetre total deflection, so I have to, if I'm going to stay with that design, I have to somehow rework it to reduce my car guide deflection from five to three millimetres. That sounds like a huge reduction, but because the deflection is, it goes according to the cube law of the distance between the fixings, I actually only have to make a relatively modest reduction in that distance. And just for completeness, I've you know, I've, I've just put in that things like the bending stress is, is proportional to the distance between fixings and the buckling stress is according to the, the, to the square of that. And to come back to this question earlier about uh, how could you select the guide rail in the first place, the equations which govern deflection uh, are quite easy to rearrange. You can actually calculate a minimum guide section size for a given guide rail and fixing distance. Um, and, and that's what a lot of people do as a first guess. And then, then they, they use that first guess to go through the calculations. Of course, in the modern days with, with electronic calculations and, and you know, software packages, you, just, you, could, you can easily optimize that. But I first came to all these things 15 odd years ago, and uh, it, it was a little easier to, to actually work with a spreadsheet at the time. So moving on to traction, there's a few changes uh, in the EA 150 uh, calculations. There's nothing particularly startling. Um, 
the requirement for a, a stalled car so that the traction to be lost no longer applies if the machine <coughs> is sufficient to raise that car. Uh, there's a couple of other very minor points. Acceleration rates are now down for the designer for the emergency braking situation for reduced stroke buffers. Um, and, and there's a, a sort of a, almost an editorial change on uh, considering the, the position of the car for uh, calculating the stalled position. Um, there is a little bit of guidance in there about the use of friction uh, because guide rail friction helps the car to stop in an emergency case, emergency braking case. And I've seen a few cases where frankly people have used lots of friction to try and uh, make their calculations balance. That is the general case that's in there for the calculation of applied traction ratios. And a lot of people have looked at that and said, well, we don't do very many four to one uh, systems. And actually, life is much simpler than that. Why do we have to use that complex calculation? And the answer is, of course, you don't. Um, you can use something simpler, and we'll come on to that in a, in a minute. Turning to critical traction ratios and the grooves, um, I'm going to make the point here, on the groove on, on the left is the groove I'm going to concentrate on now. Uh, it's an undercut V, so when it's not worn, it looks like a V. When it's worn, it looks like an undercut groove. Um, the equations to govern those are different, um, but we just need to consider that, it, that, that I'm actually trying to balance the traction uh, on that groove. So I'm going to choose my V groove angle and my undercut angle so that in both cases, the traction is about the same. And there's a reason for doing that. This is, this is the, I promise you, this is the only equation you're going to put, I'm going to put up this afternoon. Um, <coughs> I stopped it. Um, right, That's, this, this, this thing here is the applied traction ratio, as you know, and it's the famous inequality. The point I think I want to make about the V, undercut V groove, is that <coughs> is the bit that you use to calculate the traction of a V groove, and that bit up there is what you use to calculate the undercut. And you can choose the values of gamma and beta to make those two the same. So, you, so I'm going to come up with this sort of like hypothetical groove profile where its traction will be the same when it's a V, and also the same when it wears an undercut U. Right, I promise that is the hardest thing we're going to do. <coughs> Actually, the next hardest thing I'm going to do is make sure I finish my half, four half past five. Um, so, there you are. I, that's essentially saying that I, I, I found my values that balance the, the, the traction characteristics of this groove a 50 degree V angle, 105 degree undercut. Uh, yeah, and we looked, we looked at that hard. Sort of diagram earlier with about four to one, all the ropes and pulleys and what have you. And it, it's reasonable if you're doing a simpler lift, one to one maybe, uh, it's reasonable to make a simplification. Even if you're doing a two to one or a four to one, it's reasonable to make a simplification. But I would suggest only if you add in some sort of factor to cope with the, the things you're neglecting. Uh, I think the other thing is, of course, as your rope masses get higher and higher and higher, as travel gets higher and higher and higher, then the dynamics of the system will, will depend very much more on the, on, on the rope weight, and you can't ignore those. So again, I think you need to assess the, the travel, the lift, and the weight of the ropes compared with the main system masses. And the only, yeah, the other, the other thing I would just just say is that in making a simplified calculation, you need some sort of factor in there, I suggest, <laughs> uh, because traction is really important. <laughs> if you lose traction, and your method of protecting against sending car over speed or uncontrolled movement, if it's acting on the traction sheet and you lose traction, then you're out of control. So the fundamental assumption in, in the standard that, that we stay, that we keep traction. Right, so that's traction. We move on to rope factor safety. If you remember, it's guide rails, traction, rope factor safety. You're on the home leg now. Um, and again, the, 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 the 
calculations aren't changing here. What's changed is that there are new values of this thing called n equal to t. Uh, so when we look at a traction sheave uh, groove, the standard gives it a number depending on how fierce a groove it is, and that's the equivalent number of simple bends. A simple bend just being a rope going over a, a U, uh, pulley with a, a U bend, a U groove. Uh, and there's essentially the, the, the factors have been increased for uh, V grooves from 36 to 45 degrees. So they've been subtly increased um, with experience that's come you know, since 1998. Uh, and, and I just want to look in a minute, look at the implications of doing that. There's some other guidance on, on, on reverse bends, and there's also an annex that gives a bit more help in, in terms of understanding how you apply the equations. So we said that, that these values of the equivalent sort of number of bends for a traction sheave through a V-groove has increased. Um, so I took the worst one on, on the example you've got in the paper. The, the worst case is where uh, that, that factor goes from four to six. And it, in my case, it increased the, the required factor of safety from 15.5 to 17.6. So a relatively modest increase in factor of safety. <coughs> Um, I think my comment on that would be simply that designers need to watch out for that if they're close, to their fact yeah, they're currently close to their factors of safety. Occasionally I'm asked about rope pressure in the groove, that disappeared after standard 16 years ago. You do it now for performance reasons as part of the selection of your rope and, and, and your sheave. Really, my, my punchline now is, you remember I, we defined two kinds of grooves. One was initially the unworn V, then later on the undercut groove. Um, the standard treats them very differently for factor of safety. So in other words, the, if you like, the damage or the stress that we're doing to the rope uh, in, the, in the hardened V groove compared with the undercut groove is quite significant. So on this slide, I'm showing you the, the values of n equal t. In other words, the number of qu equivalent number of normal pulleys uh, for a 50 degree V and the 105 degree undercut. And the undercut is significantly nastier. What that means is that if I'm doing a design and I use hardened V grooves, I'm going to have a, a lower required factor of safety, and, it, and therefore potentially I can use fewer ropes. So, uh, uh, just wrapping up fairly quickly now, I can, can see where the time is going. Um, guide rails, we need to consider the things that are holding our guide rails and deflections in those. Uh, faction, there's, there's, there's some changes in the calculations, um, and, and uh, you, you could argue it's, it's been simplified and made it a little bit easier with some of the guidance. Uh, rope factors of safety, essentially, is just a change in some of the V-groove factors to use gone through some of the engineering implications you're all still awake I think any you know I think we're now heading for the bar aren't we <laughs> unless there's any questions <laughs>